It's Rick Bassman here for Talking Tough, where each Wednesday we talk to one of the world's most toughest men or women at their most vulnerable. Whether it's a WWE superstar, the leader of the Hells Angels, the Mexican Mafia, a UFC superstar, or the head of the Navy SEAL JSOC team, the most interesting guest, having lived the largest lives, going deep behind the scenes, all the wild and crazy stories they've experienced in their lives and in their career and then segueing to them facing down their biggest challenges. Did they hit rock bottom? If so, how did it happen? Are they still there? How did they get themselves out of it? What have they learned? It's stuff we all can relate to in our daily lives. Here at Talking Tough, we strive to be equal parts entertainment and inspiration. Please join us every Wednesday for Talking Tough at YouTube or at Launchpad One. Hey everybody, Rick Bassman here for the latest episode of Talking Tough. This should be a, a fun one, a very interesting one for sure. Uh, surprisingly, I don't really know this guy, my guest tonight that well. We'll tell you about him and who that is in a moment. As you all know, typically these are my like longtime buddies that are on last week. Last week's guest, as you know, was Butterbean, one of my longest time and best friends on this planet. And, you know, it tends to make the conversation flow easily. We know each other. There's no surprises. We can get into it. Well, the gentleman tonight, who you know as Buff Bagwell, interestingly enough, I had never met before. I didn't meet him once before. Um, he probably doesn't remember. I barely remember. It was in passing. It was like a quick and a pleasant exchange, but it was a while ago. And then I found myself in Atlanta at, uh, at Diamond Dallas Pages not long ago. And uh, and Marcus was there and I got to know him as much as I guess you can over a period of a couple of days. And I'll, I'll say this right now. And he's off screen listening to this. He's probably either going to laugh or go, fuck you, Rick. But he was he was different than I expected. And because the thing is, this guy has a reputation and we're going to talk about that reputation tonight. And, you know, I, I don't like to presuppose or prejudge anything. But I'd heard some things, and I'm happy to say that the guy I met is not only a, a person who defied what I heard reputationally, but just like a super solid and, and cool guy. So we'll talk about who he is as a human as we get into it. Before we do that, you think back to the glory days of World Championship Wrestling when Eric Bischoff, also a friend of mine, basically like just blew his load on every piece of high price talent there was. We know about that. Um, I'm not saying I'm for it, against it. That's a discussion for another day. What WCW was not real good at was developing new talent. Yet this guy kind of like came out of nowhere and was this bright, shining, explosive star that came right up to the level of the Hulk Hogan's and, and, the Macho Man Reddy Savages and my dear departed friend Roddy Piper. He proved himself on that stage. And ever since then, there, there's all kinds of legends surrounding this guy in the pro wrestling world, mixed now with questions about where he is, what he's doing, what's next, why he is where he is, which has been pretty well publicized. I'm, uh, I'm rambling. I told him I was going to just like shoot on this intro and kind of wing it as I go. I think I've, uh, I've said enough. This guy to me is fascinating. I'm looking forward to learning more about my guest tonight and hopefully my new friend after this uh, hour, Marcus Alexander Buff Bagwell. <laughs> that was great. I really enjoyed that. That was special. Oh, well, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah I, I, I never try. Thank you. I, I never <laughs> know. I don't prepare anything. Oh. If I do well, prepare, first, it's first really thing, bad. First thing, can I cuss? Go, please. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't like cussing, but every once in a while, I, I feel like I just want to make sure I didn't want to cuss without y'all cussing. But um, <laughs> the first thing I thought when you were talking was me flipping out and cussing y'all all out about my shaker. <laughs> right. And then me realizing what I had done and going, "Look, guys, I'm fucking sorry." I, but y'all really had no idea what had happened. And I just put all y'all on full blast. So 
I really had to really show you, and not fake, because I'm never fake, really had to show you who Mark Bagwell really was in a very short period of time to get that kind of introduction. So I'm very glad the introduction was that well, because I did show my ass about that shaker. And I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, no, man, that is all good. Thank you for that. It's a good start, though. I appreciate that, dude. And, <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's funny because, because you know, you advertise yourself as real. And I support that. I believe that. I've seen that. <clears throat> Let, look at you, man. At the same time, you are such a freaking character. Oh, my God. It's like you look like you're ready to go back, like, on stage, whatever type of stage that might be at, like, any given time is, is like, Buff Bagwell, like a, a louder version of Marcus, the person, or are you guys like one and the same? Um, I believe that all of us and in, in pro wrestling just is an exaggerated version of ourselves. I mean, you know, Marcus Buff Bagwell is just an exaggerated, turned up wide open Marcus Alexander Bagwell. I mean, you know, it's, it's just easier to be a heel. You got no rules. So you can say all the things that you want to say without having to say the other guy's great before you say it. You can just put everybody on full blast. And it's and it's funny. Um, the one thing I had a problem with is is I was funny. And 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 with and with WCW, they wanted to make me a heel. Like when Scott Steiner would cut somebody's throat, for example. Everybody was like, oh, my God, he just cut his throat. But when I would cut somebody's throat, I would laugh about it. And it was kind of funny the way I did it. And I couldn't lose that part of it. I just thought it was kind of funny. So it was really tough for me to, you know, be a vicious heel because I just love being a smart ass. So it was but it was definitely Buff is just an exaggerated version, an extreme exaggerated version of, of Marcus Alexander Bagwell. I, thank you. I appreciate that. It helps because I wondered. I wondered that. I wanted to ask you that when we met, and I neglected to do that. So, so I appreciate you being candid in that answer. You you mentioned the um, the example of cutting throat and Scott Steiner. Now, you you and I both know, and Scott's a friend as well. But we all know that you know Scott was perceived as being scary and legitimate, and we all know in real life that that is who he is. People are yes. terrified of this guy now. At that time in wrestling, there there were a lot of guys that were perceived as pre, being pretty damn serious and threatening. Like we all know about Ming and, and Haku, whatever you want to call it, and all the guys like that. In there is a smart ass heel. Why in in an era when things were sometimes a little serious, why do you think you got over to the level you got over to? Well, in the very beginning, you got to realize, man, that. I was the youngest by 10 years on the whole roster. And here I am, you know, a pretty good looking guy. And, uh, but very, very, very humble at the time because of Missy Hyatt brought me in the business. I was a very, I was a pretty humble guy anyway, in the very, in the very beginning, because of just knowing what Missy told me about how tough this business is to get into. And so, you know, I found myself, you know, knowing to shake hands and to, and to thank everybody and to say hello. I was a very well-mannered kid for my parents. But at the same time, in this industry, you got to really walk in and pay your dues by shaking hands and kissing ass. And I did so. Um, and I had, a, I had a little more of a hard time, I think, because pretty boys in this business, they get the fag thing, the gay thing, you know, and, and no matter – in life that just comes along with the territory of being a good looking guy. And so I had that tag on me a little bit with all oh, he's gay, he's queer. And all of a sudden this 10 year younger than anybody kid, that's a pretty boy. They found out happened to be a badass. And I found that with the boys of a locker room being tough guys that they found out that Bagwell would knock you out. And it helped me tremendously because yeah. we were at a club in Jacksonville, Florida, and all the guys were in there. And this guy was running his mouth, and he hopped up on me. And pow, one punch, and the whole all the boys saw it. And I had tough, badass guys walking up to me and going, how did you knock that guy out? 
did you did you mean to did you what did you do and then all these guys would pull me into a locker room where nobody else could hear them but i could tell it shook them so here's this kid that throws one punch and knocks a grown man out with one punch and it really helped me tremendously in the industry of a lot of tough guys because yeah. they saw that bagwell would hit you it absolutely would uh, up and i want to talk more about that but first up until that point who was giving you who was giving you shit? do you mind saying i don't usually oh, like shooting goodness. all these interviews on anybody but oh no yeah but tell the truth for sure wcw days and people want to know this stuff for sure absolutely it was you know it wasn't it wasn't horrible because sting came in pretty quick and saved me and when sting accepted me it was it was it was just everybody else accepted me but you know the style i was scared to death of the steiner boys because i would see them do things the rookies and stuff and I, anytime they came into a locker room, I just switched locker rooms, you know, and it wasn't too long. I had to do, I mean, I didn't get messed with too bad, but it just, it would have been a lot worse if Sting hadn't hopped in my car and me and Sting just really hit it off. So that really saved a lot of it. And even when he came in my car and we started riding together, it took the boys a little bit of time before they accepted me because they, and the Steiners were the, the, probably the hardest to win over. And we got the closest. I remember Stan came to my house one day to shoot basketball and he drove the limo up and all the, all the, all the neighborhood was out seeing Stan come to my house and he got out of the limo with the blonde hair and everything. We're shooting basketball. So um, on my recorder that day was two separate messages, one from Rick Steiner and one from Scott Steiner on Marcus Alexander Bagwell's recorder and it blew sting's mind he was like it was just a six months ago these guys hated your guts but once they got to know mark and that mark wasn't a fag and wasn't a pussy then they knew that you know i was kind of accepted in the tough guy locker room it helps man you have you have to be able to get yourself up you know in 1991 i think it was i'm not great at years i don't have the best memory for that I was working, if you can imagine this, get ready for a laugh. I was working for Herb, Herb Abrams in New York. And if he, do you ever work for Herb Abrams? Oh, my God. Never. It was, everything you ever heard was absolutely true. And probably times two or times three. Wow. But, um, oh, it was nuts. And uh, back then, I was, believe it or not, I was kind of like buff, like buff. I was in the best shape of my life. I was pretty jacked. And I was in the locker room. And some of the boys started giving Paul Orndorff shit because they're like, hey, Paul, that that kid over there, I was a kid then, that kid over there has got a better body than you. And I'm like, oh, holy shit. You know, I didn't want any part of that. So or Orndorff started in on me. And I kind of did like the nose to chest thing on him and went back at him. And he backed off, but not because he was afraid of me, probably because he thought there was no upside in it. And I didn't like I wouldn't like my chances in that fight anyway, but um, I was certainly willing to give it a shot just to prove a point. And after sure. that, it was cool. Ne never again. So good, good for you for being able to uh, to stand up early. Yes, and, and again, I, you know, I think the platform was made a lot easier um, just from you know the, I had a background of, of a pretty tough family, and and then it wasn't too long that it spread. The rumor spread about me shooting my dad. And I'm not sure if you even know that story. I've ever heard it, but never heard that uh, one. No. Six, 16 years, 17 years old, um, late 87, early 88, my, a 17 year long lumber company uh, with a rich Bagwell family was going broke. So 17 years, I knew nothing but money, Corvettes, motorcycles, things that cranked and rolled uh, for Christmas. Santa Claus came to the Bagwell house incredibly and he always left things that cranked and so it was a wonderful wonderful 17 years well it came to an end in 1988 and it, and it started telling my tearing my family apart the two brothers were, were already moved out and i was the only i was the baby and i was left at the house and mom and dad were fighting bad about the business long story short i hear my dad and my mom fighting one day and i go down and break it up and i'd gotten you know i've been two years in the gym and i'd gotten I gained 20 pounds or so and got some muscle on me. And I went to break mom and dad up and kind of threw my dad off with some, with them, with some power. And, and the family I was raised in, it was 
that kind of pissed him off. And so he went straight for the gun, grabbed the gun, pulls it on me. I'm like, look, dude, come on, man. At this stage, it had been about a six months of torture of normal going broke and a lot of fighting. And so I'm like, look, man, put the gun down. You're going to kill one of us and go to prison. It's just, it's just ridiculous. You know, the doorbell rings. My mom, he goes, get out there and get the door. And he shoves her by the back of the head. And I go at him and he pulls the gun back on me, you know. And I'm like. You don't actually think he was going to shoot you, did he? I, I mean, you know, gun put at me and cocked. Things get out there. Right. Okay. But, I, you know, I, I can remember not being the least bit scared. Like, I remember my first comment was, look, bro, you're just going to fucking shoot one of us. You're going to kill us. And you're going to go to prison. Just put the gun down, you know. It wasn't like, oh, my God, you know. So. He, your mom went outside and then he told me to get the keys out of the cars with by gunpoint. So I went outside and as I'm outside, my mom thinks if she leaves, you know, it'll be a lot better. And it would have been, we and my dad would have probably worked things out and it would have been fine. So as she's trying to leave, I couldn't stand to be embarrassed. To this day, my biggest pet peeve is being embarrassed. Um, so still, still. yeah, still, yes. And so the stomach cable, the cable guys there to the, that's who's at the door. And so my mom's trying to get out with her truck and my dad shoots all four tires out of the truck and then proceeds to pull my mother out of the half roll down window. Oh boy. And I, I know this has got to be a medical medically called something, but no drinking, no drugs. I see the cable guys see all of this and I was so embarrassed and so angry that I went away. I blacked out or whatever it's called. It's got to be a medical thing that happened to me because I went, I went away. Um, I went to totally away. And when I did go away, I ran past three guns on a refrigerator that had been there my whole life. And same house we grew up in the whole time from five to 18 at the same home. So for you know, 13, 14 years, right by the refrigerator that had guns on it to his closet, got one of his guns, come outside and there's bushes about chest high and the guns below the bushes. And my dad's on that side by his car. And I go, Hey, you want to pop some cats? That was, that was the saying back in the eight, late eighties, nineties. And he, he looked at me like, what? And I pulled the gun up and this, the next thing that happened seemed like it took two minutes. And it was my brain going, boom, shoot the window out, make an impression, boom, shoot the window out, make an impression, you know, make it a, make it a impression out of this, boom, put it on him and kill him. Last two shots, I put it on him, hits him in the arm. I don't know where it hit him, but it's something I could tell it hit him, but he goes behind the car and the Bagwell family, he may have another gun or with a knife or coming to get me. So I'm out of bullets. I run back inside, lock the door. I go get my 45 automatic. I put one in it, grab an extra clip, come back down, knock it at the door, look out the eye thing, open the door. It's my mom. My mom goes, you shot your father. I'm like, you crazy bitch. I tried to, I saved your life. So, so he, uh, so at this stage now, I go over, grab the phone, call my brother, John. He owns a drywall company, Bagwell Drywall. I go, hey, John, you need to get over here. I just shot dad. You did what? I said, just get over here. So at that stage, I want to go face my dad now. I want to go tell that motherfucker how mad I am at what he's put us through. So I walk up to him with the 45 automatic, and the last thing I wanted to do was cry. And I walked up to him, and I said, you have tortured us for the last three fucking months, man. And he goes, just as cool as you could say it. He looked at me and he goes, if you don't mind, I'm bleeding. And I go, motherfucker, I hope you bleed to death where you're standing. And I started crying. I didn't want to. I walked back inside. The cop county police come. The, I guess the guy called him. Well, I'm upstairs listening. And my dad says he shot himself cleaning the gun. And my brothers show up and one of my brothers cuss and the cop kind of police said, Hey, what's your language? And my brother goes, fuck you pig. You ain't, you ain't, you can't be at our house. We, we didn't call you. So my dad and my brothers proceed to kick the cop kind of police out of our house because they can't be on our property because we didn't complain. 
So they got to get off our property. And the cable guy was out there still trying to. So my friends, I didn't know this at the time, but my mother got my friend that was upstairs rocking in a bathtub during all of this. He goes out and talks to the cable guy to go on his way and just let things go. Long story short, I moved out for a couple of weeks, but you know, 10 years, 20, 30 years later, I am best friends with my father. No, that's great. So, that's great. And do you guys, uh, do you ever tell this story together to people? The point at the start of this story was to tell you that that got out at WCW. <laughs> and I had to tell it 50 times. <laughs> that, that is fantastic. Now, have you, you and your dad ever sat together and told this to anybody like jointly? Yes, it's on a DVD called The Good, The Bad, and The Buff that I did. All right, all right. So I, it's, it's, a, it's a great story, man. But it's, it's already a, it's a real, it's gonna, a real good one. I'm going to warn you right now, though. I'm going to get some shit out of you tonight that you probably never said publicly before. That's my challenge. I love, I love it. We're going we're gonna to work on that. But I, but that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Now, your dad took the blame for shooting himself. You have since publicized that you did it. He didn't die, so thank God. So you can't be arrested for murder. I guess the statute of limitations has probably expired on that. So you're clean now. You can tell that story. Yeah. Yes. In, uh, in 2013, in, in, uh, at, at my rock bottom, I broke into a, uh, a liquor store. I'm uh, sorry, a pharmacy slash liquor store. And I stole a bunch of Vicodin and I was shot by the security guard. Now, I and I walked out of the store after getting shot, just walked out and the guy didn't stop me. So I couldn't have told that story for seven years, but now I can brag about it to whoever I want. So it's pretty cool. I love it. I love it. But biking and were you hooked on pain pills? Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. You know, I know we can save that for a little bit later. But uh, <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I know we'll um, find a little bit of common ground in uh, in that and probably in what I often refer to as the pro wrestling diet. But we can uh, we can save that for a little bit later. Uh, yes. I so you're in WCW. You're there. You're new. You're with all these established stars. Were you a fan or did you kind of accidentally stumble into it? I wasn't a fan at all. I uh, I knew who Ric Flair was. I knew who the Road Warriors were. I remember my brother Stevie dressing up like Dusty Rhodes. Um, we watched wrestling. I remember I knew who Gordon Soley was. Uh, we watched wrestling and we deer hunted. We were a Southern family. Um, but from like every, like I hear, and I used to hate to hear this, but it's exactly what I used to do too, which is when people say you wrestle, they would say, I quit watching that. I used to watch it when I was younger. Yep. But that's a true statement. And that's what I did as well. I watched it when I was younger. And when I got older, I hadn't watched it. I didn't dress up like it at Halloween. I didn't want to be a wrestler. I didn't know nothing about it. I went to school out of being broke to the Atlanta School of Massage. I had a 1.8 grade point average and because I was going to work for the lumber company because we were rich and we were going to be lumber company people forever and we were good to go. But that ended in 88 so, and I just had graduated. So I want to do something with sports, like maybe sports medicine or a sports trainer. Um, so I massage was the quickest way to get some kind of money coming in. And it was one of the first things you had to do to be a sports trainer. So I went to Atlanta School of Massage. I graduated number one in my class and I loved it. But in a few months, I found out that I was going to have a hard time with the female clientele. Um, I thought that would be the easiest part of this job. But women, true to, to be true, they are very self-conscious about an attractive massage therapist massaging them. Sure. Where they, they talk a big game. But when it comes down to going in that room and taking your stuff off and getting under that sheet, it stopped. I had women see me and would cancel the appointment as soon as they saw me. So I was really having a battle with this at the same time of the battle of what am I going to do with my life now that I spent 10 months to graduate the Atlanta School of Massage. I'm at the pool, really depressed. Missy Hyatt enters my life. So that's how I got in this business. And she what? She be, I guess she just wanted a massage, right? No, she had no idea about the massage, but true, good point. She right. just saw me at the pool 
as I came back from the pool, I saw her moving in right across from me. And at 18 years old, I think, that's kind of ironic. Didn't think nothing about it. At the, but I'm engaged to a to a, a, a girl. And I was like, um, I was telling the, I was telling on myself so I wouldn't get in trouble. Hey, I saw this hot bond today at the pool. All of a sudden, on the door, and it's the girl. So I open the door, she walks in. Hey, I'm Missy Hyatt, World Championship Wrestling. What? Uh, World Championship Wrestling, da, 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 da. You should be a wrestler. And I'm like, those guys don't make no money. And she said, our lowest paid guy makes $100,000 a year. And I said, do what? So started talking to her a little bit about it and broke into business with a guy named Steve, the brawler lawyer that trained me. Yep, sure. All right. And then there you were. So you got recruited in. You weren't a big fan. Like Sting, yeah. obviously, not a fan. Right. Like Goldberg. So that's uh, that, that's good company to be in there for sure. It, it helps if you grow up watching it and intrinsically knowing it. But obviously, you guys have proven you don't you don't have to do that. But I also know that when you get into the locker room, and I think you started to talk about this, and the boys know that you didn't come up on it, you're kind of an advantage. They, they, they want you to be that guy. So you're this young, seemingly brash guy with a great body. And as you said, maybe good looking. Um, you're, you're not a wrestling fan. Um, I mean, to me, it sounds like a heat magnet coming into the locker room for the first time. Tons of heat. But Missy, Missy knew this going into it. I would have never made it without Missy. Even did she if have that much respect amongst the boys that she could act as a buffer for you? You know, they really, no, I, I, I never got heat for Missy getting me. Everybody knew Missy got me in the business or broke me in. But Missy didn't get me my job, and it and it was it been okay if she did, I think. So I never had heat from Missy. It was more they thought I they thought I screwed her, they thought I was with her, and I really never did. We were just really good friends. Now she dated a lot of my friends, <laughs> but I never was there because I was always with somebody when we knew Missy. I actually met I had, I actually pulled a gun on Eddie Gilbert when they were getting divorced because. During us knowing Missy and me starting to train, I hear a commotion outside my door one night, and I look out the eye hole, and there's this dude and Missy fighting with my gas grill into in her doorway, and I'm like, I open the door with a 45 automatic, and I go, hey, motherfucker, what's up? And the guy turns around, it's Eddie Gilbert. I got to switch hands with my 45 and go, hey, Eddie, nice to meet you. Uh, so, so Marcus, three, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't shoot Eddie Gilbert also then, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't shoot Eddie. But three months later, I got to wrestle Eddie on Global on ESPN. So I got to say, hey, Eddie, are we cool about the gun? <laughs> he he would have had his way with you otherwise, from what I understand about Eddie Gilbert, huh? you damn right. So, but yes, to answer your question, to go back to it, I had a truckload of heat. It was a heat seeking magnet it was just it was crazy how much heat i had but again sting saved a lot of it plus my good attitude of being a good kid really kept the heat off of me for a long time and and it really helped a lot just being a good kid that people that there was nobody that met me that could say i was anything wrong with me i was such a good honest bright shining laughing cutting up kid good well-mannered kid there was no person that met me that could even lie so if they met me it really worked and i, I got over with them in it because it was a shoot i was a shoot good kid now that being the case you know sometimes as you know you know your your reputation said otherwise why would you have gotten that reputation where would that come from and, and I mean, it definitely, when, when I turned to buff, you know, I, I mean, and I'm sorry if that's rude or challenging, but I know people, no. hear, you know, cause I know you're a good guy and I've, and I, I've confirmed that since, uh, but other people might be going, well, that's not what I heard. So, right. well, well I, I do believe that turning to the character of buff bag will play, played a part. I mean, I'm sure it did, but I didn't feel like it did. Like a lot of the guys that knew me would say, are you being buff right now? Or are you being Marcus? You know, and I'd say, you know, I'd say, oh, I said, Buff's over here. We'll bring Buff out tonight or something. And everybody knew I kind of kept them separate. But 
surely along the way, I, I got him a little confused and mixed up and, 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 and not on purpose, I don't think, but I think even at the end, there were just things happening that shouldn't have happened, you know, just like, you know, I would get heat for things that I really didn't do, you know? And I mean, like Goldberg one time was mad at me. I have never turned down an autograph in my life. And Bill was upset with me about something that Lex I needed to fix. So I, I wait outside in Orlando, in Orlando and I'm waiting for Bill. Bill pulls up. He proceeds to tell me that he sees me on an airplane, turn down an autograph of a heavy woman. And I said, Bill, that's just not true. And he proceeds to tell me it is. And I got to say, I'm sorry I did that. And so that's the kind of depth I would go to try to fix things or whatever. But I do think it was just part of also getting over. That comes with a lot of heat. And sure. don't get me wrong, I was in pretty damn good shape. That comes with a lot of heat as well. And the yeah. boys, even, even me and Scotty, as close as we were, we eventually fell out because the boys would be like, Bagel's catching with you, Scotty. Bagel's catching up on you. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't nowhere near looking like Steiner, but it started messing with him, so he didn't like it. You know, so it's just the whole area of the way I looked and the way I was coming up and everything, it just had heat attached to it regardless, you know? So it was just a pretty tough battle. Sure. You know, so you come up, you came up fast. I mean, you got a big push relatively, relatively quickly. Yes. And you're in with the most established veterans in the business. Did, um, so I, you know, I look back and I go, oftentimes, I wish I had appreciated that at the time. Um, I wish I'd had that perspective on that, whatever that might be at the time. Um, do you look back at like at the apex of Buff Badwell's success in WCW and say, I really appreciated that while I was there, or I wish I had done and thought about X differently? Every time I start to do that, and God, you've explained that perfectly well, but every time I get ready just to put myself on full blast on how did you possibly blow what you did? How did you possibly blow the position you were at? I start to remember that the impossible happened with Ted Turner selling out to Vince. And it, even though still, if I would have been sober right there, I think I could have pulled it off. But in the world I came from, there was no way a buff Bagwell could get fired unless he was at least warned. And so with me never being warned or ever being in any kind of trouble, I just thought I'd have to be warned, hey, Bagwell, get clean. Hey, Bagwell, don't do that again. Some kind of warning before you could possibly fire me. No, you're moving I, into the... Uh, Moving into the WWF days now. Moving in from WCW to the WWF in 2001, when Vince bought us, this is a junction of, you know, Buff's got a lot of heat, and, and I went from, you know, a bunch of money to 175, and but no complaints about any of that. Go to the school. But it was, I, had a, I got in a fight with Helms down there and slapped him, and here I go. Oh, man, I love Shane. Why would you slap? Why would you slap the hurricane? He's a cool dude. Of course, cool. there's a story, and there's and he's course. got a he's got one, and I got the yeah. truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I'm sorry. I have the truth, of course. I, I, I want to I want to interrupt for a second because I definitely want to talk about what happened at WWE, WWF. I think it was still called at the time. Yes. But going back before they got the F out, right? Um, but going back sequentially. At the apex of the NWO, because I mean, you were in the NWO with the who's who of yes. the like, A-list names in the industry. Yes. What what did that feel like to you at the time? Did you ever did you ever take stock and go, "Oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever," or were you just kind of like, "Ah," eh, or you didn't notice it? No, this was definitely a "Oh my God, thank you so much." Every check I got from WCW. No matter where I was at in my life, I went to a knee 
and I said a prayer to God. I knew what was happening to me from 1991 to 2001. I knew what was happening to me was special and I was thankful and grateful for it. And, and I really, really, it meant a lot, man. And being in the NWO, I mean, the day they came, even day Kevin came in the locker room and asked me if, if I wanted to be in it. I mean, from that day on, I mean, I'm in, I'm in limos with, with Hulk Hogan and, and Lex Luger's and Sting's and, I'm on private jets with Lex Luger's and Eric Bischoff's and the writing team. I mean, I'm I'm in the I'm in the I'm in the private jet, bro. You know, I'm I'm flying into towns, getting in limos, going to the building, getting back in a limo, catching a private jet back to my house when everybody else is at a hotel. I mean, you can't get no more heat than that. And we had to get out of a limo and and with Eric Bischoff and hide. So the boys don't see us, but act like we're not hiding from Eric. So it was like a double, it was like a double thing we had to do. We had to act like we're enjoying time with Eric in the limo, but really trying to hide from the boys over there in catering. It was horrible. <laughs> but it still sounds like you appreciated what you had while, while you had it. In, in no doubt. No in doubt. I never forgot where I came from and I was extremely thankful. I was I fit the role, but man, it was always very positive and very thinking. And I knew what I had was special and I treated it that way. That, that's amazing. So a lot of people look back and say, I wish I had appreciated that then. So it's nice that you got to appreciate it while you were living it. That That's cool. Um, but now I will say in 2001, that's where I do beat myself up, but it was a, a big challenge. It was I mean, nobody, Rick, as you know, nobody is main event one week and gets fired the next. Nobody. So there was something going on that I had no control over. And the rumor is bad match. And my mother called. Come on, man. There's more to the story. But still, I still could have somehow controlled it, I think if I would have been not addicted to prescription drugs. Well, this, this is a move over. And it's a famous story. You had the match with Booker T. Yeah, and you got the word after that up until that point. And, and I'm glad that you brought up the prescription drugs and that you were not sober because it's a good segue to get into that topic because we, we can't left. We can't leave that unexplored, obviously. All right. So this is this is a weird question, but I'll ask in, in 2000 WCW. Do you mind saying how much you're being paid at that point? Uh, 600 grand. Wow. OK. I mean, that's like. That's an unfathomable fig figure to most people in sure. life in general. So Missy Hyatt approaches you at a pool. You're like, ah, oh, there's no money in that shit. She said, well, maybe there's a hundred grand. And here you are a few years later making $600,000 in doing the limos and the private jets. Um, I, I want to ask you for a story, but on a scale of one to 10, where were you on living that like, uh, storybook, sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. Uh, I mean, the rock and roll lifestyle, I wouldn't say nowhere near a 10, but living a rest, a rich wrestler's life, uh, a 10 and a half. I had, I built a million dollar home. I had a theater room. I had two bees on my staircase. I built the house from the ground up. Um, the bees were, of course, for Bagwell, but Luger started the rumor that it was for Buff Bagwell, <laughs> but it wasn't. My house I grew up in where my parents had two bees on the front door for Bagwell. So I did the same thing in my house. Yeah, and then Bagwell. Out all those years later. A that tribute, was... but of course, Luger ran with it and made it <laughs> Buff Bagwell, which, of course, it spread like wildfire. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I built my house. I had a, I had the. $85,000 Jag that only made 500 a year. I had the Harley nobody had. I had the body nobody had. I was making the money nobody had. I was living a 10 and a half, but married, married, uh, addicted to prescription drugs, but no hardcore drugs, no, no Coke. I mean, it's Coke every once in a while and stuff, but drinking prescription drugs and really staying kind of maintained with it for a long time. Did, I didn't, did, did you just say drinking and prescription drugs? Yes. <laughs> Didn't you know that on the side of the bottle, it says, do not take with alcohol? Did you miss that part? 
It also says don't drive when you take that. That's true. That's true. But I, I, I got six reasons I did that wrong. <laughs> I guess you did. All right. So prescription painkillers. You've mentioned that a few times now. We're going to flash forward to WWE here, WWF in a moment. When did when did the pain pills start and why? Uh, the, the pain pills all, it was pain pills and somas. And they came at the same time, well, and they came, time. and they came together. I don't know why it switched to us realizing that it was just a soma buzz. But for some reason, it was one and two. It was a pain pill and two somas. Was the wrestler's concoction with Coors Light? No alcohol. Nobody had liquor. Nobody did liquor. It was just it was just beer. And believe it or not, at the time that made a big difference because the alcohol, the liquor, made it out of control oh it it accentuates that uh narcotic buzz big time yeah a lot more and so it was always lower tab my the 80 percent of my addiction was with the lower tabs and somas and i don't think they even make lower tabs no more no they don't you're right but lower tabs and somas were my were, were everybody's go-to and we had the mexican guys bringing us in thousand bottles thousand pill bottles and it was just we had it ran to a back before there, there wasn't one computer back then so we had three pharmacies three doctors oh, yeah. and we had it rolling brother it was just a perfect perfect storm of just prescription drugs with alcohol and we were never without and i had a couple of pharmacies working for me and just when you got money you can do anything you want and it just it just really got out of control but with with it was just for fun at first and then and we were very good about it we i didn't take a pill or drink a beer until 6 p.m and then somewhere along the way it got to be a reward system for working out oh yeah and we had no idea that it was going to be the end of an era <laughs> but it really was the start of the end of of what we had going because we couldn't make it, we couldn't manage it no more. And we started making, but it, but it made for an incredible body. Me and Luger looked incredible over this regiment, but we use a reward system and we did, we had to train before rewarding ourselves. So we, we, I mean, we would do chest, try 30 minutes of cardio, abs, calves, but then we went in and we rewarded ourselves and it worked for a long time. But then when WCW went away and there was no leash and the WWF fired me, it became unmanageable. Yeah, you know, I definitely want to get to that. And that's a perfect segue um, to really get into the, the the hard stuff here, if you will. And I, I can see you're very transparent about it. So that's great. Um, yeah. uh, what, what you're talking about, you mentioned cocaine and you said not too much, but a little bit. Um, you know, that's. In my book, which finally comes out this year, I, I refer to that as the pro wrestling diet. Now, and, and here, here, here's how I describe it. I just want to get your take on this. I think you've already said it. It's like, well, you know, you get hurt. Kurt Angle tells the story perfectly. Have you talked? Well, if you talk to Kurt about his story or not, but um, he'll talk about how you know, as <laughs> as the all American hero, he lived that life and was never going to put anything foreign into a system, but got hurt. Then he's on the road night after night after night. Ow, 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 ow. Try one of these. No, 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 I'd never do that. Well, certainly you break down. You have to do it because you're in pain. You're with your boys. You're in your tribe. You're insulated. And it's just, it's in front of you. So you take one. Well, here, have a drink with that. Oh, no, no. It says right here on the bottle, you can't do that. Well, 30, 40, 50 exposures later, okay, I'll have a beer with it or a whiskey. Not for you, but for some people. Right. A point you got that like perfect collusive and I, we're not advocating anybody out there for this buzz please don't take this the wrong way but we alluded to it earlier that perfect buzz of the alcohol and the narcotic mix you know hitting your synapses right at the same time then you're open to anything someone puts a line of cocaine in front of you you're probably going to do it um, it's just how you may not seek it out you may not be buying it but hey you're famous you're rich you're rolling large someone's going to put it in front of you especially back in those days and, and, and the reason I'm like going on about this, Mark, is people, you know, I was at a funeral again this past weekend for Ken Yasuda, uh, 45 years old, Mr. Japan. He was a wrestler for Inoki. Um, 
how do these guys keep dying at 45? People, my friends who are accountants and doctors and lawyers, they want to know this. So I, I explain this diet to them. And it's so crazy to me because, I mean, you're describing yourself and Lex as like, from my vantage point, the absolute poster children for this diet. Because the other side of it, I tell people, is, well, you add to, well, to keep on the same side for one more ingredient, you have the alcohol, you have the narcotics, the painkillers, you have the cocaine. Well, you're probably going to add anabolic steroids to that mix because in this world, we're making money back in two th year 2000 on how we look cosmetically. It just comes with it. It wasn't taboo. It was just a thing. Um, mm -hmm. No one really knew yet. People suspected, but no one knew what the ramifications would be. Okay. The flip side, though, is we really watch our diets religiously and we work out like motherfuckers. I mean, the, you, you put it all together like that. It's a little crazy and a little perverse. <laughs> Don't you think? Absolutely. Like it's, all, it's, it's, all it's, of ingredients. If there would have been a camera on a couple of days of me and Luger, nobody would have even believed it. I, I mean, it just, it was such, nobody, but even the guy that showed me how to get lean, I was drinking 25 beers a day, every day. And he would see me and go, I can tell you're drinking your water. And I'm so glad you're not drinking beer anymore. And I'd be like, yeah. And I was slamming 25 beers a day. We had it figured out, Rick, like y'all did too, of how to eat perfectly. And I, we also found out that it wasn't a beer belly. It was what you ate after you drank that beer. Beer got the blame for it. Beer's got nothing to do with having a belly. I was shredded and drank 25 beers a day for five consecutive years and was buff bagel. Yep. It's what you eat after those beers. Me and Lex would eat grilled chicken and broccoli every single meal. You guys are saying drunk about that stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but we stayed drunk and on somas and pain pills. But that was because we just we we knew that diet was everything and we were just we were going to work out and we were going to eat right. So it was just the we had the perfect perfect concoction <laughs> absolutely now ultimately though that concoction is going to catch up with everybody even supermen like you so yes. how does it start to catch up where where do you go from here to sorry from here going up and starting to dip down a little bit when when, when what does that look like and when do you notice this hey stacy stacy Bring me my bring my charger, please. I gotta charge my phone before it goes out here. Um, no worries. For, for me, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it got a little fuzz. There's like a little uh, interference, crackly interference. Here. There's a little buzz with you. Um, let me see, maybe it's my phone. It's not sharp. Just mm -hmm. So, what happened to me Rick, was. The WWE. Marcus, I mean, your your voice is coming through like super crackly now for some reason. It was perfect before. Is, is, it, is it still? Now you're good. Now you're good. So a minute ago, yours was coming through crackly. I think it's because my phone was about to die. Um, okay. Perfect so, now. So um, unfortunately, what happened to me was this peak that started to level and had two ways to go. It could have kept going up or it could have started going down was when the WWF bought the WCW. And I didn't know it at the time. And I needed some advice from, from some, from a, a, a sting, a Luger. The problem was they were in deep with me also, but I needed some advice from somebody and there was nobody there of this is a big time for you and you need to kick out. But there was no kicking out. I was, I was all the way in. And again, I was leaning on getting warned. I was leaning on getting this, except that didn't happen. I got fired and I was like, wait a second, what happened? So if there would have been a warning or anything, I would have probably kicked out, but there was no warning. There was just, I just, like I said, main event one week, 
Jim called me up and said, you know, hey, you're good to go. We'll, we'll see you in Atlanta. I show up in Atlanta and it was, they, they said I'm getting released, but I knew I was getting fired, but you know, it was over. So that's when it happened to me was I had a big chance to really start over at WWF. I look at the Miz every time I see the Miz, that should be Marcus Bagwell. What? I could have been the guy with 25 years yep. at the WWF, WWE, and been making a living this whole time. Very easy if I just wouldn't have done that. And you know, if you're if you're you know, if it's the nuts were candies and but your your every day would be Christmas. But you know, so I get it, but still that is the time. Right in 2001, when the WWF came in and bought us, was the time for me to excel and kick out or to fall in, and and I didn't have the chance, and I fell in. So you're, you're for, so for context now, when you say Jim, you're talking about Jim Ross, I'm guessing. Yes. Who's the head of talent relations at that time, who yes. you knew from WCW, I'm sure. Yep. All right. And you're, you're mentioning if you had been warned, what would that warning have consisted of? What 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 warning would have resonated with you at that point? Well, like who gets fired, even if it was true, over a bad match? The the match that I saw, there was not one mistake in it. It was it's it may that, not a psychology. It's not that, bad, man. It's not that it, bad. No. It may not have been psychology a good match, but who the hell gets fired over a psychology bad match if that was the case there'd be 10 people fired every night so it was it was no warning of like you know hey bagwell that was a bad match any more bad matches you're fired hey bagwell your mom called she calls again you're fired you know i got i didn't get any kind of even i didn't know i was blown away when i walked in that room and jim ross and, and johnny ace and jim um, and, and uh Vince McMahon were in that room that day I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, I'm getting fired. Keep in mind, I never had a job to get fired from. And I went, I had to raise my hand. And Vince goes, you don't got to raise your hand, Mark. I said, I feel like I must. You're telling me I'm getting released. What's the difference of getting released and fired? And they had, they had a difference. They said, if, if we released you, we would uh, we can bring you back in three months, and if we fire you, we can't. So they were trying to make released better. So I'm still not getting warned. I'm still getting lied to. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not fired. I'm coming back in three months. But really, I'm going. There's no way that's possible. So I asked the question again, and Vince goes, "You don't got to raise your hand." And I said, so I asked another question. And he was, and I could just tell it was over, and I, there was nothing I could do about it. It just there was no. I wasn't like looking for a warning. I just hadn't gotten in trouble. So how do you get fired without there? There's, there's gotta be a little bit of fire before I me, mean, a little smoke before there's fire. There was smoke, but I didn't see it. <laughs> all right. All right. So there's somebody somewhere has some rationale behind this. It'll probably, it very, very possibly makes no sense at all. So right. let's, let's assume Let's just take the leap and say you are absolutely unjustly released. What does that, first of all, now I want to ask this question. Maybe you haven't been asked this one before. How do you look at that now? Do you have any remaining bitterness over that now? Is it just something that happened to a different version of you and you've moved on? How, how, do, how do you look at that at this point in your life? Man, I, 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 to be honest with you, uh, I think about them listening to me right now and them going, you know, back, well, get over this. It's 23 years old, bro. Are you kidding? But I don't, I, we're talking about it. And I don't know what else to say except the truth. And the truth is Jim Ross lied. Jim Ross called me up and he said, and here's the problem with it. Jim, me, and God only know what happened that day. And God ain't going to come on this podcast to tell us. And in the world of wrestling, Jim Ross is going to be believed much more over a buff Bagwell. And I get that. But what truly happened is Jim called me up after um, the Booker T match and said, hey, we got big plans for you in Atlanta. We want you to take off these house shows. We'll see you in Atlanta 
get ready. Man, I was fired up all week. I was in the gym. I was tanning. I show up in Atlanta and I get fired. And the story is my mother called to get me out of those towns, which isn't true. And, and the bad match is what the reason they fired me. And again, I watched the match back and was like, what are they talking about? It ain't went like a barn burner, but it wasn't bad. So, yes, I have a truckload of animosity over it because it cost me millions. But is it the same old story that everybody's heard? Yeah, so I get it, but it's a pretty damn good one. All right, so I'm going to challenge you now. You ready for a big challenge? I am. If you have if if you have any remaining animosity about this at this point in your life, how do you get past that? And if you could get past it, would it give you some peace that would be helpful? I'm working the 12 steps right now. And um, this is, you know, this is one of my things I'm working on. It's a huge thing. Um, so I'm, you know, going through the steps and doing, doing my, doing all the things I got to, you know, ask for forgiveness for and everything. So um, this is the one I'm, I'm having to work on. It's the biggest one. I mean, this is, this was a life. I mean, how I explain it is if you get fired from McDonald's, it's just a McDonald's job. But if you get fired from McDonald's and you don't know why, it's 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 a little bit different. It kind of messes with you. I got fired from a major job and I really don't know why. I mean, I know that it was, you know, I know what I mean, I think I know, but I was told a bad match and my mother called, which neither one of those are true. Yeah, that's pretty that's pretty weird. You know, yeah, Mark, so I, I can tell you this, and it's almost like having a private conversation for a moment in again, I'm bad at years, 92 maybe. You're you're a you're a southern boy from. Do you remember a place called Pleasure Island at Walt Disney World? Oh yeah. Well, I don't know if you know. I used to run Pleasure Island. That was my job. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, I worked for Walt Disney World, and it was a hell of a job. It was great. I was uh, early 30s. It was a dream. And a couple years in, I was given the choice between resigning or being fired, and the guy that the guy behind it was my boss, um, who I like really carried a, carried a grudge against for many, many years. And the reason he put in front of me as to why he would fire me if I went that route um, was manufactured, absolutely manufactured. The guy had it out for me. I have theories why I don't think I don't waste energy on it anymore. I used to spend a lot of time on it. He had it out for me. He was going to see me gone no matter what. And that was that. Um, dude, that ate me up for years. And I can tell you this now, I honest to God, just don't give a fuck about it. And, <laughs> and I can tell stories about it now and make it fun and actually have fun. Like internally, I don't feel like any stress or any pull when I tell it. So I, I'm like, I'm wishing you with this one thing, because I can tell in so many ways in your life that you are at peace. Um, I'm wishing you peace with this, man, because you'll feel so much better once you obtain it. And I know that you will. Absolutely. And, you know, and and I and I do I search for it because it's I mean, the resentment is, you know, I've I've got resentment. Stored. And like I said, if it was something I truly did, then let it be something I truly did. But it's not. But again, it none of that matters when you're working the steps. You got to just you got to it's got a resentment. You got to put it on paper. You got to let it go, man. You just got to let it go. And it's just, it's just time to let it go. It's just, it's just a beating a dead horse. Yeah. But again, when we talk about it, it's a good story. Yep. It's not something I'm devastated by still. It's not something I lose sleep over, but you also got to realize I'm still in this industry. So I hear about it. just, just in New York, just seven days ago, a girl and I, and I can't, I'm not going to lie about anything. It made me feel so good that she said this. A chick walked up to me and she goes, you got a minute. I said, yeah. She goes, I won't keep you long. She goes, I just want you to know that you got screwed over at the WWF. Wow. And, and I just, from it coming from a chick, I, I looked at her and I said, that means 
I said, it shouldn't, but that means a lot to me that you know that. I go, how do you know that? She goes, because I've followed your career and I know the reason they said that they fired you and I know those aren't true and I could just tell that you got the raw end of the deal. And I said, you're right, I did, but somewhere along the line, I'm sure I didn't do everything quite right. And so, but thank you for noticing that. It meant, it meant a lot to me that she said that, a girl. So, you know, it, and again, that's one out of 10 million people that may have that view on it. But it made me feel good that somebody did see that, you know, and I'm sure she's the only one, but somebody did see that, you know, even, even Conrad Thompson said it beautifully. Somewhere along the line of that, of that 20 years, I talk about a lot, Rick, that I lost. I lost 20 years. And I talk about there were my recovery speeches that I lost 20. And in that 20 years of losing, it was about half, about 10 years of it was every podcast talking about the bad match, every podcast talking about my mom calling, every podcast drilling me about that. And then all of a sudden, the next 10 years, including Conrad, turned into, wait a second, how did a bad match and his mother calling Really keep Buff Bagwell out of the WWE. Yeah, there, there's, some, there's something else going on there. Yeah, but and um, even your Conrad Thompson started taking up for me. Like, what could he have possibly done to piss him off that bad? <laughs> you know, I, I what what I hope and believe at a certain point it, it won't matter to you anymore, and that's no. that's going to be that's going to be a good thing. Um, because again, I can already see so I can already see you're like getting so much freedom in your life, and that's just going to be another another level. Absolutely. For sure. Um, so if when's the last time you talked to Jim Ross? Oh man, <laughs> 15 years. And if you saw JR in an airport now, would you go up to him? Oh, absolutely. Cool. What would you say to him? I, just hello, how you doing? Cool. I really would. Yeah. Good, good. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but don't get me wrong, I would love to pull him to the side and go, hey Jim, come on, man. Tell me really what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love to, but I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I'm with you. Dude. You know, it's like, and I have my, you have your Jim Ross thing. I have my John Cena thing. You know, it's like, <laughs> and like you said, with Jim Ross, he's got a bigger platform, so he's going to be believed. And, you know, and I thought the same with John for years. Well, it is true. He's a much bigger platform, so he'll be believed in this reputation he has about being a good guy. It will be perpetuated by his platform. So I didn't want to fight that. But thinking that way gave me so much bitterness for so, so many years. And like, even though in my mind that like I did everything for this guy and he fucked me, it's like if I if if I were in a room with him now, I would like genuinely wish him well. And it, it's nice. And believe me, I'm far from being a guru, man. I have so much to learn and I have so many deficiencies still. But, you know, having like achieved at least that feeling is a good thing. And I like it. And I'm glad to hear you would greet Jim warmly at the same time. Absolutely. That's it was, you know, at that stage, at that stage, it's, it's, it's all, it's just so old and it's just, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just, and I, I do, I do think it's a big part of recovery as well with not just working the steps, just the mere fact of being sober just frees you of a lot of things. And that's one of them. It's eventually, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll tear off and go away as well. Okay. So let's get on to this. Now you're in recovery. What are you in recovery from? Prescription drugs, alcohol, just craziness that that brought me, um, recovery of my old life. It, it is. It's a whole life, isn't it? It's not. Yes. It's not just the drugs and the alcohol. Although, it kind of accentuates a lot of underlying damage, doesn't it? Yes, a lot. And and what you don't at the time, you just don't see it because you're just in a different frame of mind. It's just, you know, just I mean, just like you know the the Gigolo show I did. I mean, looking back on it, I I would have done the same thing. I was in a position to where I was broke. And I needed money and I had a car wreck and I got back into shape, but my, I changed my number and my phone went away from promoters and I was presented this idea and I did it and it saved me. It saved my house. It saved my, it saved money. And 
you know, it just, it really made me a lot of money doing it, but you know, and I, I think I would have done the same thing again, but you just don't think as clear, uh, you know, on, you think you are because you've been sedated for so long. I mean, I was sedated for 20 years, man. I mean, I, you know, in a pretty good, at a, at a complete slurring level for the last five, I can't find a cameo that I did where I wasn't slurring my words. And so it got really progressively worse and worse then. Yes. Uh, yes. But I didn't know it. I, again, the pills, they, I think they keep, because I think it's such a slow change yep. that people accepted my talk, but hearing me talk now, and if I could play the cameo for you right now, that of right before I went to rehab, it would blow your mind. It would blow your mind. You'd be like, oh my God. I mean, I'm slurring my blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, I, and it's, I, but I think people got so used it. to yeah. that tone and it was normal. So when you watch that cameo now, what 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 do you feel? Well, hold on, two part question. When you first went first got sober, and you looked at that cameo for the first time as a sober person, what did you feel? And what do you feel when you look at it now? Uh when I first looked at it, I cried. I cried. Um, it really upset me, and. And I'm not that kind of person. I'm not mad about my past. It was a past that I chose. I chose to sedate myself. And it worked for a long time. So I I just lost the managing part of it because that's what happens. You just become unmanageable. The the, the it was it was mine was going from beer to liquor and then liquor to Xanaxes and then Xanaxes to up in the game and the pill numbers. And, but I really believe as crazy as it sounds that liquor played the most vital part. Not crazy at all. Different yeah. things affect different people in different ways, certainly. And so when I look at it now, um, you know, I, I, I cry, I cry, you know, I mean, back then I cried, but, you know, but looking at it now, I, it embarrasses me. It's the only thing that I'm embarrassed of because I couldn't believe that every cameo I looked at, I was slurring my words. I just, I thought, surely to God, I'll find one that I'm sober. And, and, and I couldn't. Everyone, I I could just see that I was dragging a little, and I just had a little bit of a, and, but it was like horribly, compared to this voice right here horribly sure and did you get this is like a very incidental question but did any of your cameo recipients say anything five stars and tips on every one of them <laughs> right. Swear yeah. to God. well that's that's part of the mastery of being deep in it you can fool anybody right i i, I really believe even the cameo that steve and them use for the ddp change your die show where right. I was, look at me i'm good looking the horrible cameo that I gets devastating watching, I I look at it and go, what was I thinking? You know, but I but you just don't at that stage. I really had lost touch. Yeah, Marcus, I've seen that because I have the uh, I have the sizzle reel for Change or Die, which you just mentioned. <laughs> it's horrible. And for for context, everybody, real quickly, um, Marcus has worked very very closely with Diamond Dallas Page, uh, a dear friend of both of ours who, as many of us know, has helped to turn around many lives. And Marcus is uh, one of the cast members slash stars. I don't know if you want to say star for a show like this, but we'll right. say it. Um, called Change or Die, which is uh, an unscripted series, a reality show, as we call it, that you'll all see sometime soon, which is uh, pretty damn pretty damn miraculous. So hats off to Diamond Dallas Page and the work he does and, and for you for participating in it. Um, yeah, the world's going to uh, be pretty excited when they see the show, I think. I think I think so, too. But I saw that cameo in it. <laughs> it's pretty bad, man. It's, it's horrible. Bad. I would have I, I would not have given you five stars for that cameo. Sorry. And, 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 the, and true. What truly happened on that one was it was a kid's birthday that I was trying to do. And, and the, everybody's trying to talk me out of doing it or whatever. And I'm threatening everybody to, to keep the camera rolling. And, and, and it's, and I really, 
I can't, I mean, I just, I mean, when I saw that the first time, I, I've never cried at something I've done. I cried the first time seeing that. I couldn't believe it, but I actually cried. Well, wait till, uh, I mean, I'd say wait till people see the difference at where you be, where you came to at the end of that series, but but they can see it here. They see, yes. it, here. They see it now. So there, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about the present day. We've already been on over an hour. This has gone really fast. And I, I so appreciate your time. I know it's half past midnight, your time where you are. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, let's ask about two things that are, are relevant to the present day. The, the easy one to answer is this. What are you excited about in life today? And what, what are you what are you building? Um, it doesn't have to be business or professional, though it certainly can be that. But what are you doing now? What are you looking forward to that's exciting in your life? Right now, the most exciting thing in my life is, is my girlfriend, my relationship. I had been out of a relationship uh, for the only three years of my life uh, from about 49 till about 52 53 is, is around that area, but three full years of being by myself. And I'm in a wonderful relationship. That is definitely number one. But uh, number two is I really, really want to save lives on getting sober. Um, I wanted to do it where I had some kind of new way to do it and a cool new way to do it. And there's no such thing. It is, it is a, my father used to say, lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. And we always took that as followers were losers. Um, you're supposed to lead, follow, or get out of the way. So you're, we were leaders. We were always leaders in everything. In the, in the world of recovery, I really believe that you got to follow. I do believe that when I followed in this world of recovery, I succeeded to being 14 months sober, 400, 422 days today. And I really believe it came from following. So the saying does say lead, follow, or get out of the way. So I think it's okay to follow. It wasn't what I, my father taught us to do, but it's okay, I think. And I think it's the way to go with recovery. I think you find somebody that's done it, and I think you follow what they did. The problem with that is, it's the same, same exact um, ingredients. What's the what's it called when you get ingredients? It's a to make something. You're making a your ingredients. You've got a recipe. Recipe. It's the same recipe. Thank you. It's the same recipe, brother. It's thirty days of, of rehab. It is from at day thirty one. It's aftercare. Uh, at, at it's one hundred twenty days there. It's ninety meetings in ninety days. It's find a sponsor. It's it's everything that I used to hate to hear. If I heard 90 and 90 one more time, I was going to kill somebody. I did it this time, and I'm 14 months sober. You wow. need to follow somebody in recovery if you truly want to be sober. And I think I would love to people to listen to what my suggestion is of finding somebody. And I think I got a good story to boot to make them see, and I would like to be able to save some people's lives. Wow, that's that's beautiful. And you you said it, you could be a leader by following because as brilliant and good looking as guys like us like to think we are, yes. we have to reinvent every wheel, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and there is a proven recipe for this. So it's very well stated, thank you. Thank um, you. So something's coming to me in, in what everything we've talked about and what I'm hearing here. So I'm kind of, this is on the fly, but I want to see how this goes. And I, I want to quickly put you on the spot for a couple of things. You are what I would call, a, you're, you're a proven promo master for sure. Um, you know how to hit your times. You're very articulate, obviously. So I have these things I call elevator pitches. That's a Hollywood term. You Are you familiar? I'm not. Well, it means like you, you're an aspiring screenwriter and you found yourself in an elevator with the head of a studio and you've got him captive for one minute between floors. You got to pitch that movie in one minute. Um, that's an elevator pitch. It's a Hollywood term. I like that. Pretty cool, right? I love it. Let's say you're, I'm going to put you on the spot with some elevator pitches here. 
Can you give us six? And it's going to come out better on the other side. So don't be put off by this. Can you give us 60 seconds on your rock bottom slash how fucked up you were? What did that look like? 2020, August of 2020, I'm in a barn doing several lines of, of meth for the first time in my life. I dabbled in it, a hit there, hit there, but was really like partaking. Proceed to clean my parents' house to an unbelievable shine. And then get in my car thinking I'm sober, pop a couple of Xanax to get it off of me and drive my car through a marta bus station bathroom men and women's i level the building three hundred thousand dollar building i go through behind cumberland mall and i wake up in the hospital with my right knee patellar tendon exploded and i have injured myself with a lifelong limp for the rest of my life and i wasn't even there i was I was driving the car, but I wasn't there. So well, once, you, once you woke up and you understood what happened, how did you feel emotionally about all of that? I was so mad at myself, but still not too mad because I'm going to fix whatever's wrong and it's all going to be okay. So I got more mad when I found out and then that's what led me to, but it led me to getting sober. And that was when I found out that it wasn't going to be healed and it was getting worse. I dove in even more to my addiction with pills and drinking. And, but that led me to Diamond Dallas Page and my niece intervention on me and me going to recovery. So what's the 60 seconds in on where you are and who you are now? I am so happy where I'm at. I never really thought that I wanted to be off pills. I thought I really had it figured out that I liked the way I was on pills. I had it all figured out, but I couldn't been more lost. I am. Life is just much better remembering everything. I remember I lost 20 years over being sedated. And I remembered everything I did in the past 14 months. I want to remember every day like I have the last 14 months instead of forgetting 20 years like I just did. That's amazing. That that man, that is it's so good to hear. And and, it, and it's so real. Um, I, I hope a lot of people take this message. Here's the last one for you. What does okay, so deep fake technology is a big thing these days. Let's say somebody put in front of you, you're sitting there where you are right now. You're happy, you're positive, you're looking toward the future, and some crazy scientist puts the younger most fucked up version of you in the same room that you're in right now. What do you tell that person? I tell him that he's going to lose everything if he doesn't kick out, if he doesn't listen to me, because I know, and it's going to be hard to listen to me, but if you do not put the alcohol down and you do not put the prescription drugs down, you're going to lose thousands and thousands to millions of dollars please put it down and listen to me you will be more happy than you've ever been you will be in the best shape of your life you will your relationships will flourish personally with with women and with your friends your family everything you do financially especially and god every avenue of your life I promise you, Mark, will be better if you just put the prescription drugs and the alcohol down. Awesome, man. You know, I want to thank you for your time and for being like so open and transparent. Um, a, a lot of people, most people, as you know, want, want to hide behind an image they've constructed for themselves. And I, I really love this time with you because you have this like such a very, very like specific image. You look at you, you're, 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 people see you as a character, sure. uh, you know, larger than life, uh, you know, cartoon character come to life, comic book hero come to life. Yes. Say it. Um, yet today, I feel like you've really revealed the, the, the human behind that perceived character. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate you. I had a great time doing it.
but so good to see you, man. I'm glad we've become friends. And, uh, dude, I'm just wishing you the very best of everything and excited to uh, watch you as you uh, continue on your successful.